This is Breakthroughs, a podcast from Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I'm Erin Spain, host of the show. As the Delta variant of SARS-CoV-2 is causing breakthrough infections in some vaccinated people around the world, scientists at Northwestern Medicine are developing and studying potential next-generation COVID-19 vaccines that could be more effective at preventing and clearing breakthrough infections. Joining me to discuss this topic is Pablo Penloza McMaster, an assistant professor of microbiology immunology here at Feinberg. He is a viral immunologist whose lab studies how the immune system is regulated with the goal of developing better vaccines and treatments. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Erin. I appreciate this invitation. Well, let's start off by being very clear here. The vaccines that we have today are effective. They are working to prevent very serious infection and death in most cases of COVID-19 and its variants. Tell me why it's so important for everyone who hasn't been vaccinated to do so now. Believing in in vaccines is believing in history. Vaccines are really among the, the greatest discoveries of modern medicine. And they, they have contributed significantly to the increase in the uh, life expectancy in the last century. So in, in regards to SARS-CoV-2, uh, the, this virus can, can result in not only severe disease and death, but also long-term complications, including chronic fatigue and many other neurological diseases. Actually, uh, we're studying right now in collaboration with some clinicians at Northwestern Medicine, um, Igor Koralnik and Lavanya Visbarati, were actually looking at long haulers and looking at brain fog and and how yes. these uh, patients that have long term complications what what is their immune response? Mm-hmm. And we probably are going to be publishing some interesting data soon. You know, when it comes to to viral infections, especially with SARS CoV two, what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. <laughs> Oh, really? And, yes. Yeah. So the, <laughs> Interesting way people, to think about it. <laughs> well, it, it's, um, you know, Erin, the, the real clinical footprint of SARS-CoV-2 will be known more over the next couple of years uh, as more and more people continue coming out with these long-term complications, such as chronic fatigue, brain fog, and also even neuropsychiatric disorders such as schizophrenia and psychosis. I think that another consideration is that every time that the virus infects a new host, it not only replicates and transmits to other people, but it also has an opportunity to mutate and evolve into different variants. And this is because the the process of viral evolution is inextricably linked with its replication. So when the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase which is the protein of the virus that replicates its, its RNA genome, it, it, it's actually an error-proof polymerase, but it actually, it, there's some mistakes. It, it does make mistakes sometimes, and these mistakes are the basis for evolution. And these new sequences that it could acquire, it has the ability of changing the biology of the virus, rendering it more transmissible, but also potentially more virulent. And again, your lab aims to improve viral vaccines and treatments for infections like COVID-19. And tell me about the current COVID-19 vaccines and how you're looking to improve upon them. Right. So I think it is important to clarify that most of the vaccines that we have right now, they don't actually prevent infection. They prevent severe disease and death. And that's ultimately, that's what we want vaccines to do the most. We want vaccines to prevent death and morbidity. In the case of SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, they, they do offer protection from symptomatic infection, but mostly they offer protection from severe disease and death. So, so with that consideration, there's all this uh, new evidence that there's breakthrough infection because there's no vaccine that is 100% perfect. And once again, because they don't necessarily prevent infection, they, they prevent disease. Our lab is focused on making vaccines better and initially, before the pandemic, we had a specific interest in chronic infections such as HIV. But this pandemic made us take a little bit of a detour. We're still utilizing our toolkits and our, our expertise, but we wanted to go one step further and, and think how can we make vaccines better, especially SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, 
and decrease the incidence of breakthrough infections by devising a regimen that could reduce the incidence of these breakthrough infections. So all of the vaccines that are either approved or in EUA in the United States for SARS-CoV-2, they use this spike antigen, which is the surface of the virus, is what your immune system first sees, is the, uh, the outside or the surface protein of the, of, of the coronavirus. And this spike protein is the, the Achilles heel of SARS-CoV-2 in a way. So if you neutralize it, then the, the virus doesn't have the ability of infecting the cell. It doesn't have the, the ability to enter in because it doesn't bind to the H2 receptor via hindrance with the, with the receptor. So, yeah, I, I want to clarify that these are excellent vaccines. They target the right antigen and they are extremely protective. But what if we combine another antigen? What if we mix these vaccines together with another vaccine that encodes for another different viral protein? Instead of an outside surface protein, what if we focus on an inside or internal protein of the virus? And if you think of, of, the, of SARS-CoV-2, you could think as the uh, surface is the spike, but then the inside or the guts of the virus are made of this nucleocapsid protein, which are very abundantly expressed in the coronavirus life cycle. So we interrogated, what if we vaccinate uh, mice? We started this first with, with mice that are infectable with SARS-CoV-2. And we vaccinated this with either a spike-only vaccine, similar to the ones that are being given, and versus a, vac- um, a combination of the spike-based vaccine together with a nucleocapsid-based vaccine. And what we observe is that the mice that received this combo vaccine, both the nucleocapsid and the spike, they were better protected against breakthrough infections. Why focus on the nucleocapsid protein? One reason is because the nucleocapsid is one of the most abundantly expressed proteins. So once you get an infection with the coronavirus, the the virus starts expressing uh, this nucleocapsid protein. So it's uh, present at very high levels very early during the life cycle. So it's a pretty good target for T cell responses. And these these T-cell responses, they're cells in your adaptive immune system that go hunting for trouble. So whenever they see either an infected cell or a tumor cell, they they just kill these cells that are spelling trouble. So in a way, you could think of T-cells as being, uh, they they curtail the initial foci of infection from the beginning, from the get-go. And then what that results is that that, that prevents the virus from, from disseminating exponentially. So it cuts one of those first initial foci of infection. And that's what the T-cell response does. So we thought, you know, nucleocapsid, because it is an internal protein, but it's abundantly expressed, then we thought that it could be a perfect target for T-cell responses. And the second reason is that the nucleocapsid protein is one of the most conserved proteins of, of the coronavirus life cycle. So among not only different variants, but also different coronavirus strains, like in SARS-CoV-1 and, and other coronaviruses, the nucleocapsid protein doesn't change as much as the spike protein. You could think of the virus as it wants to change mostly its face so that it can deceive the immune system. But the inside, the guts of the virus don't really change as much relative to the spike. Well, and you published the results of this study in Cell Reports. Tell me, other scientists are also looking at nucleoclasmid protein. What was the reaction to, in the scientific community after you published this paper? Yeah, so, so this was a proof of concept that not only spike, but maybe other viral antigens could play a critical role in mediating vaccine-elicited protection. So it, it's, it's basically a proof of concept that if you uh, combine spike with other viral antigens that you end up having better protection. And I guess the the other lesson is that it's really a corroboration that our prior data from the 2003 SARS-CoV-1, as well as, as with the MERS data in 2012, you know, with these prior coronaviruses, it was very well established that the spike protein was the Achilles heel or the most susceptible part of the virus. And that's why uh, these va- these current vaccines were accelerated because we already knew what we were working on. So, but what this study shows is that yes, that it, it is correct. If, if you compare side by side a spike only versus a nucleocapsid only vaccine, then the spike o- only vaccine does a lot better than the nucleocapsid only. So we're not saying that the nucleocapsid 
uh, vaccine is better than the spike vaccine. We're saying that both combined come for a synergistic protection. Now, again, you said it's a proof of concept. This is in mice. So now that this paper has been published and it's out there, what's happening next with this study, with the possibility of offering this combined vaccine, the SNN vaccine, to humans in a trial? The next step is to make sure that these are safe, in uh, safe, immunogenic, and effective in, in non-human primate models. So we, we hope within the next year to start non-human primate studies to look at these three aspects. Number one, safety. Number two, immunogenicity. And number three, efficacy. And then this may provide a, a rationale for, for exploring this concept further in in um, in human trials. Well, there's a lot of excitement in the scientific community right now about efforts for a universal coronavirus vaccine because yourself, you've said this, other scientists have said this, it's just a matter of time before another one surfaces, another SARS-CoV-2 type coronavirus. Where are we at right now with a universal coronavirus vaccine? Yeah, um, you know, Eric, I, I think that's a great point. This is not the first one and likely not the last pandemic that we're going to be having. So this issue of, of universal coronavirus vaccine, we have been exploring this as well. How can we make vaccines not only more effective against SARS-CoV-2, but potentially cross-protective cross even against other coronaviruses? So we have a, a preprint, which is right now in, in revision in a peer-reviewed journal showing that it's a proof of concept. So if you take mice and you immunize or you vaccinate them with a SARS-1 vaccine, this is a vaccine made in 2003 uh, when SARS-CoV-1 came out. So this is an old vaccine, almost 20 years. And then we vaccinated mice with the SARS-1 vaccine, and then we exposed them to SARS-CoV-2 to interrogate that proof of concept, whether you could get some cross-protection uh, with, with different coronaviruses. And we were surprised to see that these mice were actually very robustly protected against SARS-CoV-2, which is it, really, if, if you think about it, it's not that surprising because these viruses share a lot of homology, there's 76% identity in their spike proteins. But it's still, it's the first proof of concept that you could you could make a universal coronavirus vaccine, but maybe instead of uh, one vaccine protecting you against all different coronaviruses, maybe it's more in a way that it protects you against related coronaviruses. So in the case of SARS-1 and SARS-2, they're, they're, they're similar. So I think that the converse would also be the case. So people who get vaccinated with SARS-CoV-2, at least if we consider the mouse data, then it is reasonable to hypothesize that they could be protected against SARS-1. It's another good reason to get vaccinated with the vaccines that we have now. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, yeah. <laughs> this must be such an interesting time for you and your lab. You've been publishing a lot of papers. And as you said, you've had to shift your research from HIV, AIDS, cancer, other things you have been working on. But how has your lab's COVID findings really contributed to research for other diseases? Well, I think, first of all, the, this is a very basic demonstration that the more broad immune response you get, the more protection you get. And, and it's really not that surprising if you think about it, because uh, this, this demonstration that if you combine the nucleocapsid-specific immunity with spike-specific immunity, that, that provides some, some synergy. But it wasn't clear that the nucleocapsid-specific response would play a role at all. Overall, in terms of how the COVID pandemic has influenced the field, I'm actually very surprised about the mRNA vaccines, how effective they... I, I really was not anticipating this. In mice, they're not as immunogenic as viral vectors. At least in our hands, we have compared side by side and also part of the human trials. Uh, but, I mean, what really makes it is the booster vaccination, the booster with the mRNA, that gives you very, very strong responses. I guess the the other two points, two other findings from from our laboratory, which I think are important to to bring up, is that we show in a preprint, and this is also in peer review right now. It's it, it's a very interesting finding looking at how the priming dose of a vaccine affects 
overall immune responses. And I don't know if you heard about that study by AstraZeneca uh, saying that uh, these patients who, uh, these volunteers who got half of the dose of the vaccine and they had a longer prime boost interval, they were they seem to be better protected after COVID-19. So, so it seems that uh, there seems to be some kind of phenotype there. So we explore this further to look at how the interval between the prime and the boost, as well as the priming dose of the vaccine, affects overall immune responses following vaccination. And what we found was a little bit paradoxical. It, it shows that in, and once again, this is mice, but what we show is that if you vaccinate mice with a very low dose of vaccine, and then you boost weeks after with a standard dose of vaccine, you actually improve the response significantly more than mice that receive standard dose prime and standard dose boost. And then we look at the mechanism, what is the immunological mechanism, and we found out that a very gentle prime with a very low dose of vaccine seems to elicit uh, these central memory T cell responses that are better able to proliferate upon booster vaccination. And also the antibody response was a lot greater when you start with a low dose and then boost with a standard dose as compared to standard dose, standard dose. So that that, um, that is another finding that I think it is uh, somewhat important f- for the current pandemic because it now there's attempts to do vaccine fractionation as a way to allow more people to get vaccinated. Although one cautionary note that is important to clarify is that giving a, a lower priming dose could also result in, in a transient more susceptibility to the virus infection because initially you have lower responses, mm-hmm. right? So, so that's something that we're ex- it, it's a trade-off between having initially after the prime lower responses, but then ending up after the booster with substantially greater immune responses. So this is another consideration that is important to clarify. And then another, um, um, it is important to bring up now. It's is the issue of, of cross reactivity. How one coronavirus vaccine could potentially protect you against other coronaviruses. So we're exploring not only mice that get vaccinated with a SARS-1 vaccine, and then we show that they're protected against a SARS-2 challenge, but also mice that are vaccinated first with a SARS-2 vaccine, similar to the ones that we currently have, and then they're challenged with common cold coronaviruses. And we're showing that there's some slight protection, not as robust as the protection that we see when we do SARS-1 vaccination, SARS-2 challenge, because there's uh, more distant viruses. So if you compare SARS-2 with the common cold coronaviruses, they're more distant. So, so they're more genetically distant compared to SARS-1 and SARS-2. So the, this level of protection elicited by vaccines, this level of heterologous protection, it seems to be linked to how distant the viruses are. But at least in mice, we see that with SARS-CoV-2 vaccination, you end up having some uh, slight but significant protection against common cold coronavirus. So another reason to get vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the show today to talk about these results. And thank you for all the great work that your lab is doing. I'm sounds like you have a lot of papers. So we're excited to hear what comes next. Thank you, Erin. I, I thank you for having me over here. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe to Breakthroughs on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to shows. And if you are a medical professional, you can claim CME credit just for listening to this episode. Go to our website, feinberg.northwestern.edu, and search Breakthroughs CME. 